Hello, and welcome to the July webinar from the IEA Clean Coal Centre. My name is Deborah Adams, and I'm Studies Manager here. Our monthly webinars are based on our technical reports, which are available from our website, www.iea-coal.org. If you're a resident of a member country or an employee of a sponsoring organisation, you can download our reports at no charge after a one-off registration. Other people can purchase them from our bookshop. It's all spelt out too clearly on our website. The subject for today's webinar is potential water sources for coal-fired power plants. The report on this topic has just been published, so it's available now for download. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the Ask a Question box at the top of your screen. Add your email address as well so that um, Anne can send you a fuller answer should we run out of time. Okay, I'm now going to hand over to Anne Carpenter, who's written the report on which the webinar is based. Thank you. Right, good morning everyone, and welcome to this talk on potential water sources for coal-fired power plants. As Debo mentioned, this webinar is based on the report that I've just finished. The report continues a series relating to water and the power generation industry. The previous one looked at where water stress is occurring in the world today, as is, as is indicated in this figure. The report then examined water availability and policies for the coal power sector in China, India, South Africa and the USA. These are the four top thermal coal consuming countries in the world. As you can see, they all have water stress regions. I gave a webinar on this topic in October last year, which is still available for viewing. That is, of course, if you're interested. The third report in the series will look at water conservation within coal-fired power plants. Right, global energy demand is rising, while water is becoming a scarce, scarcer commodity in many parts of the world. This is due to overexploitation, droughts, heat waves, and other factors. Meeting the growing demand is going to place increasing stress on limited fresh water resources. The power generation industry is typically a country's largest industrial user of fresh water. Hence, non-fresh water sources will become increasingly important as an alternative or supplementary water source. I'll begin this talk by outlining the key issues to be considered when evaluating alternative water sources for power plants. Then I will discuss the alternative non-fresh water sources which are listed on this slide. I'll then examine the viability of the use of each of these sources and look at the availability and policies for their use in China, India, South Africa and the USA. And these are the same four countries covered in the previous report on water availability and policies. Right, the evaluation of the use of alternative water sources in existing or new coal power plants is complex. The key issues to be considered are listed here. The first is the quantity of water. Power generation needs an abundant, reliable, secure and predictable source of water that is available over the lifetime of the plant. Then there's water quality. Typically, the alternative water sources have a lower quality than fresh water. Therefore, you're going to need to treat the water before you can use it in order to avoid operational problems. For example, poor water quality can lead to scaling, corrosion and fouling of pipes and cooling equipment. This is particularly concern in wet cooling towers. Right, transporting water to power plants is expensive, especially if the infrastructure has to be built. Therefore, the source will need to be close enough to the power plant for economic collection and transport. Of course, the overall economics will be a major use. And finally, you're going to need to consider if there are any legal and regulatory constraints on the use of the water source. The alternative water source can cost more than traditional fresh water sources because of the high treatment and transport costs. Treatments such as desalinisation can be energy intensive and expensive. So you're going to need new treatment 
technologies that can meet the water quality requirements of power plants at a much lower energy input that need to be developed. And this will help reduce costs. Also, new materials that can withstand the lower water qualities are needed. Right, starting municipal wastewater. Treating municipal wastewater is also known as reclaimed water. It is a promising alternative water source because it's abundant and often widely distributed across the country. A number of power plants worldwide are already successfully utilising it for cooling purposes. Of course, the largest use for water within a power plant is for cooling the exhaust steam from the turbines for reuse. So most of the um, uses I'm talking about is for cooling purposes. Operational problems which have been associated with the use of municipal wastewater, such as corrosion, scaling and biofouling, can be controlled with adequate water treatment and the addition of chemicals. And human health concerns over the possible emission of bacteria and other trace contaminants in the aerosols, which are emitted from the cooling towers, can be minimised with proper control and management of cooling operations. Now both power plant operators and municipalities can benefit financially and environmentally from the reuse of municipal wastewater. For example, the power plant operator can save money if the municipal wastewater as it often costs less than the fresh water. Nevertheless, any added cost of the necessary treatment of the water will need to be taken into account. The municipality can generate additional income by selling its wastewater instead of releasing it to the environment. So using the wastewater will therefore protect the environment as well. Forty competition for its use is increasing in some areas and there's also a lack of data on the availability, quantity and quality of the municipal wastewater in the vicinity of power plants. And this was hampering its use. In fact, this is the case with all the non-fresh water sources I'm discussing. Right, now China is a water stressed country. This map shows where the coal power plants are in relation to the water stressed areas. The areas in red are the areas where the water is the most scarce. The Chinese government has recognised the importance of fully utilising its municipal wastewater resources, and this is seen as a way of conserving its fresh water resources. The provincial capitals and municipalities are being required to collect and treat all their wastewater by 2017. So this could increase the amount of water available to power plants that are located nearby. In addition, water applications for power plants are going to be rejected if all the available sources of municipal wastewater have not been used. Right, India is another water stressed country, as again you can see from this map. The blue dots mark the thermal power plants where they are in relation to the water stressed areas. Again, the red areas are the water scarce regions. India has recently made it mandatory for power plants to use treated municipal wastewater that is available within a 100 kilometre radius. Of course, the amount of this alternative water source is expected to grow with a rising urbanisation and population growth. Right, the majority of the coal power plants in South Africa are not near to the metropolitan areas. So this would make municipal wastewater expensive and impractical for these power plants. However, there are three power plants near Johannesburg that do use this water source. In the USA, municipal wastewater is the most used alternative water supply at thermal power plants. Around 5% of the 1,709 existing cooling systems currently use it and 25% of the proposed systems are planning to do so. The majority of the coal power plants are actually situated near to a publicly owned municipal waste treatment power, sorry, treatment plant, and this is shown in this figure here. The orange dots are the coal power plants and the blue ones are the municipal treatment plants. 
study found that about half of the 407 coal power plants that were operating in 2007 have sufficient municipal wastewater available within a 16 kilometre radius and this will be able to meet their cooling water needs. And the figure goes up to nearly 75% when the distance is increased to 40 kilometres. There is actually no federal water policy as such in the USA, as water policy generally comes under the jurisdiction of the states. Right, moving on to brackish and seawater. Brackish groundwater can provide an important water resource for nearby power plants, but only for those situated inland or on the coast. Seawater can only provide a basically unlimited supply for the coastal power plants. Both brackish and seawater can be used directly, that is just with minimal treatment, for cooling purposes instead of fresh water. This of course is provided the plant has been designed for its use. As there are certainly power plants which are using brackish and seawater in their cooling systems already. But desalinisation will be required to supply their fresh water needs, such as the water needed for boiler makeup. Integrating the power plant and desalinisation units can have economic and in some cases environmental benefits. Now integration could involve just the sharing of the intake and or discharge facilities or the integration, sorry, the desalinisation units can be more fully integrated with the power plant. This actually is a flow sheet for the Tampa Bay Seawater Desalinisation Plant in the USA. The desalinisation plant gets its source water from the discharge of the adjacent Big Ben coal power plant. And this eliminates the need for separate intake structures, pipelines and screens, and also for separate ocean discharge facilities. So consequently, you're saving money. Another advantage is that the coal plant's discharge water is some 3 to 8 degrees C warmer than the ambient seawater. So consequently, the energy consumption of the reverse osmosis desalinisation process is reduced, and hence the energy costs are lower. If the cooling water from the power plant is too hot, then the desalinisation plant can withdraw cooler seawater from the power plant's intake supply. And the desalinisation plant can supply up to 95 million litres per day of drinking water for the surrounding area. Right, waste or low-grade heat from the power plant can be utilised to meet the majority of the thermal energy needs of an integrated desalinisation plant. Hence, the energy costs of desalinisations are reduced. In this figure, steam from the power plant's generator turbine provides the heat source for a low-temperature, multi-effect distillation process. Right, in this process, the steam is only required to heat the saline water in the first vessel. The vapour produced then heats the saline water in the next vessel and so on down the line. And the vapour is finally condensed in the final vessel by the incoming saline water. An advantage of this integration is that the efficiency of the desalinisation plant can be improved and less cooling water is required in the power plant. And of course if the desalinisation plant is signed with excess capacity, then the power plant can become a producer of both power and water. And this is instead of being a water consumer. The main disadvantage is that the integrated system is harder to operate due to seasonal variability in electricity demand. The national governments in China, India and South Africa have all recognised that desalinisation is likely to play an important role in augmenting their water supply. China set a target for online desalinisation capacity of over 3 million cubic metres per day by 2020. And the country also requires all new power plants in the coastal regions to use seawater desalinisation to supply their fresh water requirements. In South Africa, desalinisation is one of the strategies recognised in the revised National Water Resources Strategy and this is for ensuring a sustainable water balance and the desalinisation strategy was published in May 2011. 
And among the aims of the National Water Mission in India is to promote desalinisation. And in India, a number of the district administrations, such as one in Tutikoran, have already asked industries in the areas to install desalinisation plants. This is so that water allocated to them can be diverted for domestic use. There is no national desalinisation policy in the USA, although there are federal initiatives to support it. Desalinisation, though, does form part of some of the state's water plans, such as in California. As I mentioned earlier, water policy is under the jurisdiction of the state. Right, moving on to mine water. My water from abandoned and active mines could prove to be an important source for the nearby power plants. This, of course, is in regions where their water is abundant and accessible. One benefit is that its use could turn a water pollution liability into a water resource. Of course, it could be untreated acid mine drainage can pollute rivers, streams and groundwater. Typically, the mine water will need to be treated before it can be used. The technical feasibility and economic viability of using this water source can be seen in the number of power plants which are currently employing it for cooling purposes. However, there are no comprehensive inventories of mine pools and drainage available in any of the four countries discussed. And of course, regulatory and fiscal incentives could be introduced to encourage more use of mine water. Right, China is the only country discussed that has actually set targets for the reuse of mine water. The targets listed here were set by the powerful National Energy Administration and published in April 215. And new power plants in North China have also been given priority access to mine drainage for their water use. The importance of recovering water from acid mine drainage and the reuse of mine water have been recognised by the South African government in its second national water resource strategy, which is seen as a way of increasing water availability. Mine water is already used at some of the power plants, and as you can see, the majority of power plants are actually located by coal fields. Right, as you can see from this figure, the use of mine water is limited to a few states in the USA. This is principally the coal mining states in the eastern part of the country. The treated mine pool water, for example, is already being used at six cogeneration plants in northeast Pennsylvania. These are actually small plants which are typically burning anthracite coal in circulating fluidized bed boilers. Right now, produced water. This is from oil and gas wells. Produced water from the onshore oil and gas wells are going to be a limited resource. This is generally only available over lifetime of the extraction project. Collecting the water from each well within a field, transporting it, and managing the variability in the flow and quality over time can make it difficult and expensive to use. The quantity of produced water in conventional oil and gas wells generally increases as coal and, sorry, it's oil and gas production declines over the lifetime of the reservoir. This is the opposite to coal bed methane and shale gas wells, where water production generally decreases over time. Of course, the amount of water will depend on local hydrogeological conditions. Some wells are actually nearly dry and don't produce water. Also, of course, the produced water is often injected back into the reservoir for enhanced oil recovery, and consequently would be unavailable for power plant use. Again, the power produced water would need to be treated before you can use it. But here, the combination of heat, pressure and salinity in the water may provide opportunities for energy recovery and hence help lower the cost of its treatment. For example, some water may be warm enough to drive thermal desalinisation processes. Some regulatory issues such as water ownership in the USA still need to be addressed. 
Only a few power plants are currently exploiting this source. These are mainly in Australia, where power plants are firing coal bed methane and utilising the produced water from the coal field for cooling purposes. The amount of produced water may increase in the future as countries develop their unconventional oil and gas resources. That is, of course, where these are available. The Chinese government is actually supporting unconventional gas development, and they've set production targets for shale gas and coal bed methane at some 30 billion cubic metres by 2020. This is for each shale gas and for coal bed methane. These two maps show where the coal bed methane resources are in China and in India. India also plans to increase its coal bed methane fivefold by 2017 to 18, and it plans to reach 2.1 billion cubic metres per year. Now, unfortunately, the shale gas deposits in India are in geologically complex areas, and the lack of fresh water and transport infrastructure is certainly hampering its development. It seems unlikely that produced water will be desalinized, sorry, desalinated and used at power plants in South Africa. This is because the shale gas deposits are situated some way away from the power plants. Since there's so much acid mine water in the areas around the coal-fired power plants, it does seem more likely that this source of water would be treated and used as this is currently done. This is not the case for USA, where produced water from unconventional oil and gas wells, as well as from coal bed methane activities, could potentially become a significant source of water. A number of power plants in the east of the country are located near a source of produced water, as you can see in this figure. The orange dots are the power plants. Right, another approach to minimise fresh water use at coal power plants is to take advantage of the need for carbon dioxide storage to mitigate global warming. This synergistic approach could, to develop course in site specific conditions, use deep saline formations as both a carbon dioxide storage site and as a source of water. Substantial quantities of water may need to be extracted when the carbon dioxide is stored. This is to reduce the risk of induced seismicity, carbon dioxide leakage and ground subsidence. It will also improve storage efficiency and can be used to guide the CO2 plume. Producing saline water when storing CO2 <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> has been called enhanced water recovery. And this is to reflect the similar concept of enhanced oil recovery, which occurs when CO2 is stored in oil fields. Right, the volume of water which is extracted may be sufficient to replace or even exceed the increased water requirements of carbon dioxide capture at the power plant. Right, in some cases, it may even enable the power plant to become a producer of both water and electricity. As with produced water, utilising the heat, pressure and salinity in the extracted water where this is possible could lower that will help lower the water treatment costs. There are still a number of issues to be resolved, such as technical, economic, regulatory and legal concerns before the CO2 storage is deployed. No power plant is yet utilising this water source, although a few carbon capture and storage projects are planned. The USA and China are jointly funding a carbon dioxide storage project with water recovery at the Green Gen Integrated Gasification Combined Cycle power plant. At least this is one of the potential options for storing CO2. And they're doing this through the US China Clean Energy Research Center. Some pre-feasibility studies have been carried out. Now as you can see from these two figures, there are numerous coal power plants across China and the USA that are located above or near saline aquifers, and these could, that could potentially use the extracted water. Unfortunately, this is not the case for India and South Africa, where onshine saline aquifers are less extensive. 
the particular case in South Africa where the online Ceylon aquifers are located some distance away from the coal power plants. Right, to conclude, there is a global need for more and better publicly available data on the amount and quality of the non-fresh water sources discussed, and they also on their location relative to coal-fired power plants. The lack of national databases is hampering the use of the alternative non-fresh water sources. Improvements in water treatment technologies and new technologies that can meet the water quality requirements of power plants to much en lower energy input and cost are needed. Also, new materials that can withstand the lowest water quality of the alternative water sources still need to be developed. For example, new corrosion resistant and scale resistant materials would help minimise the amount of water treatment that is required. And this could accelerate the use of the non-fresh water sources. In addition, regulatory and financial incentives could be introduced to encourage their use. And this is already happening in some countries. Finally, I'd like to leave you with this final comment, that the utilisation of economically treated non-fresh water by coal power plants will reduce the burden on the nation's fresh water supplies, whilst en enabling the plants to continue to deliver the energy that is required. In certain cases, and with a suitable design of the on-site water treatment plant, a coal power plant could become a supplier of both energy and fresh water instead of a water consumer. Right, that concludes my talk, and it just remains for me to thank you for listening. The next webinar will be given by my colleague Chen Zhu on the subject of policies high efficiency and low emission technologies and carbon dioxide reduction in China. This will be on the 17th of August at the usual time. So I now pass you back to Devo. And, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you very much for another interesting, thorough uh, webinar. Right, we're going to see if there's any uh, questions come in. So while I'm reading them. Here's the first one. <clears throat> Excuse me again, Anne. Uh, you said that a power plant can become, can become a producer of electricity and of water instead of being a water consumer. Could you give us a bit more detail on this, please? And are there any power plants where this is already happening? Uh, yes, I can think of one that is in China. The Taijing desalinization plant <coughs> uses steam from a supercritical coal power plant. If I remember correctly, the desalinization plant uses the low temperature multi effect distillation process, which I discussed earlier. Uh, it was designed to, it has actually been designed to cope with load cycling from the power plant. And I think that around 200,000 um, 200, yeah, 200, cubic meters per day of desalinization water is produced. And this is used in the power plant for boiler makeup and, of course, in the surrounding areas for drinking water and other uses. I think it was actually one of the biggest desalinization plants in China. Thanks, Anne. Uh, while we wait to see if any more questions come in, um, I'd like to remind everybody that all the the webinar um, slides will be available to download from the webinar page of our website later on today because there are a lot of detailed maps which you might want to spend a bit of time pouring over. Okay, we've got a couple more questions come in. One starts, and thank you for your wonderful webinar. Do you request more insight into the economics of extracted water from deep saline aquifers? For example, could you indicate the quality, the quantity of underground stored water that makes this process an economically viable proposition? That is quite a big question. Luckily, they've um, given their email address. If Anne needs to get back to them with a bit more detail and thought. Anyhow, Anne, have a go at it now. Um, I was trying to remember when the, the USA
yeah, since nobody's done it yet, the economics, of course, aren't really well known. But they've done initial studies and some. They certainly at the Green Gen project, there were some initial feasibility studies carried out which included economic information about it. And I certainly put that within the report um, you know, where I did find the information for it. I can't remember what the figures were offhand. So I think I'll have to get back to you. But I know um, they were talking about a water production well going to have to be replaced something like two kilometres within the injection well. Uh, they certainly talked about water treatment costs for it. But I think I'll have to talk to you a lot more because I, I only discussed economics in general terms in the report rather than detailed studies and just referred people to these studies. Thanks, Anne. Um, right, we've got another question. Could you tell us, please, about the additional uh, costs and design changes incurred when a power plant wants to use wastewater or brackish water for cooling? So if you talk about municipal wastewater, then it will partly depend on the quality that the municipal wastewater treats the plant to, because generally you get what they call secondary treatment water, which is the more common one and then you get the tertiary treated water which is treated to a higher standard. The, um, you could actually treat the water at the power plant before it's used or the power plant operator could actually pay the municipal wastewater to treat the plant for them at, the, at its own facilities. Um, both design changes would, I presume, do more for the treatment of it just to get it to the quality that the plant is, can use. And of course the brackish water, it depends for example how, how much um, salt is in it on the designalization process it might use. So I hope that helps. Lovely, thanks very much Anne. Okay, there's no more questions coming in at the moment and um, we're starting to run out of time. So we'll just give you a minute more and if, there, if you do have any more questions, then um, you can always contact Anne at the email address that shows on this last slide. Let me remind you that uh, Chen Zhu is giving her webinar on, on China. Um, HELE Technologies, HELE of course stands for um, high efficiency, low emission. So it's looking at ways to, to increase the efficiency of power plants and thus reduce their emissions. That'll be another interesting webinar specializing on China on Wednesday, 17th of August. Okay, so thank you very much for listening and we hope you'll join us on Wednesday, the 17th of August. Thank you. <laughs>